everybody. I'm your host, Deborah Henney of the Sounds Like Freedom podcast. And today I am so excited to interview with best-selling, Amazon best-selling author R.L. Shaver. Now, R.L. is a husband to his joyful wife, Stephanie, and the father of two growing unique boys. He has turned overthinking into a profitable career and continues to take that into various entrepreneurial pursuits. He grew in a small town in Southern West Virginia and now resides in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He gave his life to Jesus at 15 years old and has been in a committed relationship with his heavenly father since 2007. So welcome RL. Some technical difficulties. Can you hear me? Let's see here. Let's see here. There we go. Yeah, there we are. Sorry, I am figuring all this tech out. Go here. Hi. Hello. Have it. Hope you you? didn't mind. I have a guest that wanted to join. Sammy. Wonderful. Welcome. His name. Is this Samuel? Yes. This is my Hi. brother's Stop name. Stop. This is my brother's Stop. name. Stop. <laughs> this is my brother's name. Yep, that's your brother's name. This is my name. Yeah, your name is Samuel. Yep. All right. Ah. No, no, go play. Go play. <laughs> well, welcome to the show. Uh, Thank I you. did I already did your uh, introduction. But I read your book for this child. I have prayed, and I read it on my lunch break because I have to kind of compartmentalize my life. And uh, uh, I was crying <laughs> most of the way through it. And everybody at work was like, "What are you reading?" I said, "Oh, it's a fabulous book, um, but it is really gut wrenching." And I have to say, um, just this past Thursday, I had not. I'm not even going to say it quite compares even close to what you went through, but we had an unfortunate accident with my youngest that required an ER trip at night. And, um, and in addition to my confessions of God is my peace, God is my provider. He is with me no matter what Mm -hmm. Um, you were kept coming to my mind. And I thought all those horrible feelings that come as a parent when your kid needs emergency care and Mm -hmm. you just feel helpless and you're like, oh, and I mean, my it, for my child, it wasn't a life and death situation. It was an accident. So it's a once and done thing. We're moving forward with all the medical procedures that will be coming. But um, but you really came to my mind. And I thought, oh, what you and your wife went through for years um, with your son in life and death situations. But anyway, but please tell us more about your story and about your book. And yeah, um, I had to mirror my camera because like I'm looking at you and it looks like I'm looking off screen. So I'm like, this is going to be fixed. I got to get this right. Um, technical difficulties, right? You don't know anything about those. No, not at all. <laughs> you know, I remember um, I didn't I didn't put this in the book, but there was a point when um, there was a guy I was riding the elevator with and um, he was just you could tell he was super distraught and like riding out of the hospital and we were you know, six months into this ordeal, nine months into this ordeal, you know, to the point where we're starting to get a little bit grizzled in a good way, where you're toughening up, you know, and um, he was riding down the elevator and he was just upset. And I was like, um, hey, man, is, is everything OK? Because, you know, we're in Children's Hospital. Your kids hurt. He's like, yeah, my son broke his arm. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> you're like, OK, I wanted to. I wanted to punch him, but the Holy Spirit corrected me and said, hey, listen, you know, it's, it's not such a bad thing that a guy cares about his kid that much. No matter what, you know, motivation it was, like, ultimately, it's awesome to see a parent care about their kid. And no matter what they're going through, I mean, like, when people go through hard stuff, it's good when they care about their kids. And, um, you know, it's it's awesome. So, like, don't feel bad. I mean, we, we know how it is with emergency visits. Gosh, we were in the emergency room last Tuesday, last Tuesday, I think, not this past Tuesday, but the Tuesday before, because uh, Samuel um, was having, we, we were worried he maybe had appendix appendicitis, and he's fine. It was just something else, but, you know, 
you just rush rush your kid to the hospital. Oh, crap, we got to make sure he's not in need of surgery, you know? Right. So. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, so one thing that really stuck out to me with your book was how you kept your mind so focused and through all the the awful situations that you were going through. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um, like how I did it or just like the whole process? Yeah, how you did it, the whole process. Um, and tell us a little bit about Samuel because the book is about Samuel and your journey, you and your wife's journey with yeah. his medical care. Yeah. So Samuel was born. Um, Stephanie and I got married in 20. 2013 i think 20 yeah 2013 we met in 2012 and we had a kid right away um super excited about it steph was a little bit older than me so we're both in our 30s we'll just leave it at that uh, i might say the ages in the book we'll see <laughs> you know sh don't, don't tell a woman's age um but the um you know samuel was born we prayed for strength every single day and uh he was born with two heart defects and at first we didn't think much about it we're like okay you know he's you know, we've prayed for him. Everything's going to be okay. And he would be okay. That's for sure. But that like the point to everything's okay. You know, the point to everything's okay from where we started was a very long tumultuous point, but we always knew that he'd be, or I always knew that he'd be okay. You know, um, mainly because, you know, I was focused on God's promises. Like I was focused. Um, and I'd spent a long time like working in business and, working on being focused in my life so that that discipline carried over to this and the discipline of, of walking forward in faith when things don't look good. You know, a lot of my business um, uh, training had gone well for this, you know, because uh, it brought me to a point where I was ready to fight and I was ready to just lay it on the line. And I remember, you know, when I remember that point where things turned bad, Samuel was two and a half months old and we, um, close my email so it doesn't keep making noises. Samuel was two and a half months old and he um he ended up turning blue. Um I started in the second chapter. Like he his lips had started to turn blue. Steph knew something was wrong. I did not want her to go to the hospital again because she'd already spent a couple weeks in the hospital and I was like, I don't want her to have to go. I just, you know, we've only been married a year. Um I want to be around my wife. I want to be around my kid. My job was super stressful so I didn't have time to take I didn't have the ability to take time off without just taking a cut in pay. So it was like, I want my wife and my son around. And, um, but he ended up, she ended up rushing him down there. Uh, or we ended up rushing to the hospital together and, um, they ended up telling us, Hey, he's got to go in for emergency surgery. And it's correct. It's not even a corrective surgery. It's we're going to send him for a sur emergency surgery and it's going to get him to six months. He was two and a half months at the time. They're going to go in, they're going to put a stitch in his mitral valve and attempt to get him to six months. Like, that's a pretty brutal statement. And it was like, at that point, it was like a bomb went off for life. Because, you know, anytime you have major trauma, I don't know, it just feels like, you know, a bomb goes off in the atmosphere. You're just hiding in place. You're, you're hiding in shelter. You're just doing whatever. And, you know, thank God I had amazing had an amazing mentor in my life at the time who was just a strong man of faith and he you know encouraged me to stick into the word lay into lay lay claim to god's word um and you know just really to trust god in this process that he would fight my battles for me and um so yeah that was kind of the start of things and then as things went forward i mean it was just the blocking tackling of you have to do you know even when stuff gets thrown at you oh we're going to the emergency room once again. I've got this huge project to work and we got us all this stuff. We just, we have to get to block and tackle, take every step as it goes and go forward. But at the, all, the whole time, like I had learned and I praise God that I'd learned this to confess God's word out of my mouth, that it was my weapon and that it was what I was clinging to as my future. Not any fears, not any doubts, just God's words, God's promise that, and, um, for me, it was that God, that God's promise that he will, that Samuel would live long in the land and grow strong in the land. And that's what we held to, like, even when it didn't look like it. And I continue to confess that over him every single night, even to this day, <laughs> you oh, know? I'm yeah. sure. And I think that was really important how you said you 
open your mouth and you would speak it every day. Cause I, I know in my life, if I just kind of keep it in my head, it can kind of get muddled with a lot of other thoughts and a lot of other feelings, but there's so much power. I think when we open our mouths and we speak God's truth and we speak God's truth into the situation, for one, it gets my thoughts to stop because I can't think of something opposite of what I'm speaking. Yep. Um, but yeah. And I like how you said, God told me to fight, but God's going to fight my battles for me. Can you talk a little bit more about that? And, yeah. Cause because a lot of times when people think fight, they're thinking anger, but can, mm -hmm. um, but that isn't quite, I think, where you're coming from here. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, and to, to the point of words, like, the Bible says that um, faith comes through hearing and hearing the word of God. Mm -hmm. And so, like, we tune our minds to what we say. Like, we can program our minds. Like, what we repeatedly hear, if it's somebody else speaking it or if it's us, we begin to accept that as, as truth. And so there's a certain, an important part of it, of the element of faith that's for that. But I also like to point out that we're created in the image of God and that he spoke the entire world into existence. And we have the same Holy Spirit in us. So how much power do our words have? You know, it's I mean, I don't know. There's a there's a lot to it. I really haven't landed exactly where how much power we do have with that but i can guarantee it's probably more than most people give access to oh i 100 percent agree um and as somebody who operates in the prophetic aligning hearing what god's truth is and hearing what god is saying right now and then being the vessel to speak that forth and to call forth god's truth and god's word in the now situation is so powerful and something that we continually grow in as we operate in faith um and it can get us through all those situations too like those nitty-gritty situations of life and those that really push us to the limit and build that grit i mean there was so much grit and endurance that was forged in you and your wife through this time this season and ongoing in this season raising him and caretaking for him yeah. You know, the cool thing is, is that, um, you know, it's all just preparation. I mean, um, God takes these things at these times of our life that that are very hard and difficult to deal with. And he produces beautiful fruit out of them. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I remember I was after, after this, after after everything I went through with Samuel, I ended up having a very rough season at work afterwards. And it culminated in me in losing, or like leaving my job and finding another job. And it worked out really good. I ended up finding a job that I was doing similar stuff. But I went from like everybody treating me with disrespect and like whatever. He's just doing the work. You know, we're the ones that are important to suddenly I'm presenting to before executives. And they're going, this guy knows what he's talking about. This is awesome. You know, <laughs> but mm -hmm. um it's for it's in those seasons. Like I remember a, a guy, a, a close friend of mine, and a guy who also was just another brother in Christ. We were talking about it, and he was saying that you know, when it talks about pruning, like when you prune a vine or when you prune something, like you cut it back hard, like you cut it to the point where it's it's painful. And I remember in these seasons, there was a lot of times it was super painful. And you're sitting there going, "Can I even make it?" But you know what? Like you just, especially with Samuel. With Samuel, it was so easy compared to other things because with Samuel it's like it's your kid I mean there was a point in in the book and I mentioned in the book but there was a point in my life where I felt like it was with Samuel I was wrestling God for Samuel and I knew God was on my side I knew God wanted Samuel to be well but at the same, same time I still felt like Jacob you know when he's wrestling the angel of the Lord when he's wrestling you know depending on your interpretation of that Jesus or, you know, one of God's angels or whatever he's wrestling. Like when you're, re when he, when you're wrestling that, like, I felt like I was wrestling God in the same way, but it's like, when it's for your kid, it's like, God, you're going to have to kill me first. Everything. You're going to have to kill me first because it's my kid. You know? So it felt like for my kid, it was for Samuel in this struggle. It was a lot easier because it's like, it's my child. Like, <laughs> you know, Oh, you, you, you yeah, it's, it's like, God, this is your promise. This is your word. And I am not letting go. Yeah, right? that's exactly it. I felt like a bulldog. Like, hey, you know what? You're going to have to like kill me for me to let go of this promise. I'm not letting it go. You know? 
Amen. And I think there's another thing in your book that you said, because you talk about all the people in your life that were so vital along the way, your mentors and uh, church family, and um, that really provided a lot of support uh, and biological family also. But the, in your book, you also mentioned that it was careful, you were very careful with who you let in because sometimes people meant well, but their words were coming against God's word that he had spoken to you. Uh, yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, like our faith was, I mean, our faith was relatively strong, but at the same time, like you have to cultivate things and you have to watch who's speaking one into your life. You don't want um, people speaking doubt. You don't want people speaking um, evil. And like, they, I don't know. There's a great part in the, the the very last chapter. I decided to include Samuel's seventh surgery. And, um, you know, I had some um, a buddy from a men's group and my dad, who's not a believer. Um, both were just speaking down in my life. I had like I had the, the guy from the men's group saying, you know, well, you know, if God doesn't heal, heal in this situation, like there's great people who, you know, who've followed God's, um, you know, who really preach out god without that have never been healed and you know um i'm getting ready to go into heart surgery with my child it's not right. the thing you, it's not the thing you want to hear and um his was actually kind of the final thing because i remember talking to a few different people my dad kept saying he had a bad feeling about the surgery and stuff which actually i learned something cool about that um but coming through it um you know i realized what was going on and I realized that Satan was trying to get me to accept less than God's promise that Samuel would live long in the land and grow strong in the land. And that is just the conjunction of two verses. It's Psalm 112, 2, which says the children of the righteous will grow, will, um, will grow mighty in the land. Sorry, make sure I'm not like misquoting. Uh, <laughs> the children of the righteous will grow mighty in the land. And Deuteronomy 28 has a ton of promises about righteousness. And the funny thing is, is some people will try to say stupid stuff like, well, those promises were for the Israelites or those promises were for only the people who obeyed every single point of God's law. I'm like, I'm sorry. Like, and I figured this out in the book and I put it in the book. But like, first of all, in Corinthians Paul says that every single promise that God's ever made is ours, is yes and amen in Christ. And second of all, like most of the promises of the Old Testament are completely revolved around righteousness. Almost every single one of them. Well, what is righteousness? Well, in the New Testament, it says the righteousness is faith in Jesus. So all of my righteousness was purchased. So every single promise says I have access to. So and the reason I say all that is because this is so important and it's for the reason I wanted to write the book is I want to tell everybody that, hey, listen, these same promises that your child, no matter what you're going through, you're like if they're dealing and struggling with stuff, whether it be cancer or whatever, like these promises are for you just as much as they were for me. I'm not special. Like I'm some like hick from West Virginia, <laughs> you know, um, and like I'm no different than anybody else. It's just these promises are for you and your faith makes a big difference and like jesus said that he couldn't heal people in his hometown because their faith wasn't strong so like you having faith in god's promise is crucial for god being able to operate in your life and part of that is what you're speaking who you're putting around you what you're standing for because you really all faith is is it's a decision to say hey listen you know, it's looking like things aren't going to go my way. It's looking like this kid, my kid won't make it. It's looking like, you know, our business isn't going to make it. It's looking like our marriage isn't going to make it. You know, whatever it is that's, that you come to this point where you say, hey, there's this discrepancy. It's looking like it's going in the wrong direction. Faith is just simply saying God's promise says this. I don't care what it looks like. I'm trusting that God is there and he's good and he loves me and that this is going to be the fruit of it is his promise. And I'm going to stick to it. And I want to see people understand that they have that same power and authority to say, Hey, I can cling to this promise too. And I think, I don't even think that I'm the strongest person out there. I think there's a lot of people, a lot of mothers who are stronger than me, a lot of fathers who are stronger than me that can go through and say, Hey, listen, I'm going to cling to the same promise. 
you know? So that's, I get excited about this stuff because like this stuff is where uh, we really start to operate in power as Christians. We start to understand that we can, like, we don't have to accept the world as it is. We don't have to accept the things that are coming at us the way they are. Like the Bible says, we're the head, not the tail. We're above, not beneath. We are more than conquerors. And those things are important for us to realize that, like, we are not a victim of our circumstances. We choose whether or not we're going to accept victimhood or we're going to stand up and fight and say, I'm going to push through this hell. And you know what? Jesus said that the gates of hell will not stand against like we'll not be able to stand against us. So we need to rig, figure out if we're going to bust through them or we're going to let that gate continue to hold us back. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your story and your insight and the things that God forged in you, all that, um, the ability to stand on his word, on his truth, focus on that, even when the circumstances around you makes it look like you shouldn't. Um, yeah. And just declaring that forth and creating that support system around you that's going to stand firm with you in your faith focus. Um, yeah. Is there anything else that you wanted to share with us today or how can we get a copy of your book? Well, yeah, you can get a copy of my book on Amazon. You can reach out to me through my website. Um, yeah, I, you know, one of the things that I've been this past week, um, two people two verses about power. And it's part of the reason I'm kind of amped up. There's been two verses about power this week that I was, I was digging through. Um, one of them was, um, second Timothy three, five. And it was talking about how, like, um, in the last days, there'll be people who are religious, but they have, they only have like a, a semblance of like religious religion. They don't have the power that comes with it. And they ignore it. And like, that's what I see a lot of people at. And we don't have to accept that. We can choose to say, hey, listen, God said that we will do miracles greater than he did when he was here as Jesus. So there's that one. And then the last thing is, is like um, a big part of what I try to get out to people, what to share with people is that, you know, there's a I was reading through Psalm 89 and I like reading the, the CJB. Like, actually, I love the Bible app because I can switch through and, and read NIV, NLT, Good News, whatever. I mean, like, it's all right there. I can switch between them, King James Version, whatever you want to read. But I kind of like CJB occasionally, which is complete Jewish Bible, because I'm assuming that they probably went back to the Hebrew and they have some some time with the language to understand it. And maybe they don't. I don't know. I don't, I don't know a bunch about it, but I like reading through different versions. And Psalm 89... I think it's 18 or 19. It's weird because CJB kind of adds in the beginning of like who was saying it. So it kind of messes with the numbering. But it was saying that um, most of the versions say that God loves to give us power. But in the complete Jewish Bible, it says that when we um, when we please God, he, he empowers us. And one of the things that I've like... So an often quoted verse is Psalm 37 um, in Psalm 37 that says, delight yourself in the Lord. He will grant you the desires of your heart. Like that intimacy with God, that desiring and working with God and being in relationship with God. That's a crucial part of this warfare piece. Um, and also for anybody who's interested as well, I have a blog that I keep up. And um, I put a bunch of stuff. I know for a lot of parents who are going through heavy, heavy stuff, my book may not be for them because it's just, you know, reading through it, it is, it's what happened. And I know some people, when they're going through stuff, they're like, I can't read somebody else's stuff right now. I have too much of my own. It's too traumatic. And I get that. And that's why I put up my blog where I, I have a whole series where I talk about uh, waging war in faith and like what that looks like. And the same things that I learned. So that's out there for free for anybody who needs it, because I wanted to make that free for everybody. Um, and yeah, that's so it. Where can we find that? Um, rlshawver.com. So if you, you see my name on the bottom of the screen, just no periods, just pull the periods out, hit rlshawver.com. You can find me there. Um, I keep posting on there. So yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story and how we can align our thoughts with Jesus's so they sound like freedom. Um, be blessed and have a great day. And thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Debbie. Thanks, everybody.